And now, on This Week in History, with Paul Waite. Yes, I am Paul Waite, and this is On This Week in History. I was just reminding Callum about how OCD I was. Um, <laughs> while he, like what are you sipping? Something like that. Coffee. Mm. Autis- Goofy. Autistic, keep- I'd say. <laughs> yeah, well, I, don't, I, I, I think that's probably not, not yeah. a bad show, to be honest. Anyway, so welcome to uh, this week's version of On This Week in History. Um, some, some, again, some good ones today. Maybe not as good as last week, which was a bit of a belter, I think. So going all the way back to 196 BC, uh, Ptolemy V ascended to the throne of mm. Egypt. Uh, and I think um, that uh, Cleopatra was in the Ptolemaic That's right, yeah. bloodline. Um, it's funny, when I was, uh, I'm not quite sure of this, my facts, I should perhaps have done some research. I, I've, I always got it in my mind that Ptolemy was something to do with Greece. That's right, they're actually a Greek bloodline, so it's funnily enough, they weren't Egyptian at all. They're from, um, yeah, they're descended from um, Alexander the Great's people. So anyway, so that's that's what happened in 196 BC, and of course in uh, in uh, England, we were busy running around in Mud huts. <laughs> loincloths or something. So it's, not even that. So quite staggering, really, to uh, to get your head around. I just, I just realized that i've written i've written something down about 1484 no no um no facts against it at all so that's quite I wonder what did that you was. know that in 1484 it was 1484 <laughs> there, there we go, go. <laughs> that one, yeah. so 1484 was uh that was henry the seventh wasn't it yeah mm. anyway so we'll never know i'll have I'll, <laughs> next week i'll tell you what actually should have happened on 1484 uh because i'm a complete blockhead anyway in 1306 robert the bruce was crying robert the first um, so when I was a little boy, many of you will know that I used to collect Ladybird books. So I had a Ladybird book on, on Robert the Bruce, mm. and of course, um, in those days we were taught. So I was being very naughty then. If I was Drew, I'd be very cross with me because <laughs> I wasn't looking at the camera. <laughs> so if you wanted to look at Paul's uh, back of his head, then Paul's doing doing a good job. Uh, we were taught all about Robert the Bruce being in a cave, um, being in despair, and watching the spider weave his web. Um, we talked a, a bit, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, about the fact that actually Robert the Bruce was quite a duplicitous uh, and certainly no friend of William Wallace. Yep. Um, and uh, had, in fact, fought for the British uh, against Wallace. Uh, but nonetheless, um, he's become a legend, uh, probably more famous than Wallace's, I guess, which um, isn't really fair, but that's just the way it is. Uh, 1599, Robert Devereux, um, who was uh, the Earl of Essex, um, who uh, was pr- almost certainly Elizabeth I's lover and favourite man of all time, I would say, um, became a very disaffected uh, former sort of favourite. Uh, he was made Lieutenant General of Ireland, uh, and I think I'm right in saying that he uh, committed treason against Elizabeth, uh, and I think he, he was actually executed mm. uh just before James I became the king. But I, I will find that out for you listeners next week, OK? 1613. Very interesting, this. The very first English child born in Canada, Newfoundland, mm. to a guy called Nicholas Guy. I thought this was quite funny. I thought, well, surely it was Mrs Guy. That, uh, so yeah. That just goes to show what a misogynistic world we live in. <laughs> uh, I, I just sat there. I thought, oh, it's funny. Uh, it's attributed to Nicholas Guy. Why, why didn't it no say Mary Guy woman, or, yeah. uh, or whatever, you know? Very, very old. It is strange, isn't it? 1713, uh, Spain loses Gibraltar and Menorca uh, under the Treaty of Utrecht to the to uh, Britain, effectively. Uh, of course... Great uh, Britain. <laughs> Great Britain and Northern Ireland, yes, to be precise. <laughs> or United Kingdom. The U- Royal Muni. The United Kingdom. Royal Muni. Uh, Gibraltar, of course, uh, I suppose to some extent quite controversially uh, remains part of uh, Britain to this day. Uh, Menorca, for whatever reason, uh, was handed back to the Spanish. Uh, 1790, uh, the modern shoelace. Um, I'm not quite sure what that says. I really ought to read right properly, don't you think? Then I, if I'm going to do notes. The uh, modern shoe- uh, it's probably created. The modern shoelace with a something was patented in England by Harvey Kennedy. With those little mm. plastic bits on the end. Probably, <laughs> yeah. It was an egglet or something. Uh, uh, an egglet or... Uh, anyone listening to this who's who's more intelligent than me... And <laughs> who's a shoe so smith. incompetent. I think um, what would be quite nice, Drew, is you need to look up on This Week in History for me yeah. and see what happened in 1484. So okay. I literally have just written down 1484 and then there's absolutely nothing against it, which is quite hilarious, isn't it? So obviously mm. something happened. End of the anyway. The I can't. I really can't be bothered to do it anymore. <laughs> so uh, that is that is bring us to the end of the first section session. Even on this week in history.
I hadn't turned my knobs up again. <laughs> and talking about that, in comes Callum. <laughs> 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 oh, it's so good with it. I heard him bounding up the stairs oh, like a playful, back from like a playful break. Bambi that he is. <laughs> oh. mm. ah, so in, anyway, in 1484, uh, William Caxton printed the translation, uh, printed a translation of Aesop's Fables. Ah. Um, I actually remember sitting on my dear mama's uh, knee uh, when I was four or five, and she used to read Aesop's Fables to me. So it was uh, quite an early. Uh, I, uh, my early uh, sort of thoughts about being educated are all to do with Br'er Rabbit and Aesop's Fables. Uh, so this could be could be a lot worse. Yeah, definitely. So there we are. So welcome back, Cullen. Uh, 1866. You're going to like this one. <laughs> Andrew Rankin patented the urinal. Oh, thank you. Uh, before thank that, you. nobody went to the toilet. No. Yeah. So people used to die because they were so full of... Full of liquid and... P and P. And feces. And they couldn't do anything and then they just exploded. Yeah. Yeah. Nasty way to go. It didn't, didn't, wasn't great for uh, wedding nights. No. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going with that. Uh, God. Next fact, next God fact. Uh, 1867, a very proud, very proud fact. The British Parliament abolished the slave trade. Mm. Um, I think it had been, for about 30 years before, it had been illegal uh to sell people or something i can't remember Somewhere. so we we did <laughs> the, the, the the first bit uh the first bit of the sort of legislation had been in, in, in place for quite some time but this is now uh you know like definitively you can't do anything whatsoever to do so you could with, have slaves but not sell slaves or buy them uh, maybe i can't yeah, like I think it's, I mean, you could, they could work or something yeah yeah, yeah sure uh, 1871 the first this is I, I find this quite hard to believe even uh, the, 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 with the times in 1871 the first international rugby union match was played and the score was Scotland 1 England 0 uh. <laughs> so one presumes in those days you've just got one point for scoring something and, wow. and that's all I that wonder if that oh. was a try or a penalty or what yeah well who knows imagine yeah. what that game would have looked like back then sounds wow. very boring Mm-hmm. Yeah, rugby was so completely. I mean, even in, even you know in the sixties, mm. you know, rugby. You watch a sixties match; it's completely very different, different to um, to what's going on today. Uh, in eighteen hundred and seventy six, this is this is going to get you going, Callum. Longest ever boxing championship fight. How many rounds do you think? It was probably Jack Johnson. I don't know who it was. I just know how many how many rounds it was. Um, Maybe like a hundred rounds or something. Hundred thirty-six. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine fighting hundred thirty-six rounds? Just uh... I imagine. I reckon it was Jack Johnson. Oh, uh, I missed one. Uh, this is this is something I'm quite interested in. Uh, Eighteen fifty-nine, the first supposed sighting of Vulcan. Oh, okay. Yeah. What Vulcan is supposed to be, or is? Um, it's either a planet or a moon. I can't remember. Uh, is it real or isn't it real or what? Do you know any ideas? Any thoughts on this? Well, obviously we're not talking about the Star Trek Vulcan. It's Trekkie fans out there. This um, is a planet. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, twinned with Romulus. Mm, that's it. No, that's it, yeah. <laughs> For all you Trekkies out there, you know what we're on about. Um, I don't know much about it. No, I knew that it was a planet or a moon in real life. Yes, for, so for centuries, um, it was thought that there was a planet inside Mercury, closer to the sun than Mercury was. Wow. And it was called Vulcan. Mm. So they, they were so convinced, astronomers, that they that for some reason there was, must be you know, some perceived mm. gravitational pull or something. Something like that, yeah. Um, maybe because Mercury shows the same side to the, the sun all the time. Did you know that? No, I didn't. One that. third of the Mercury is always never dark. looks at the sun. Right, yeah. Um, mm. and, and so I think it's true to say that Venus is hotter than Mercury. I think that's a fact. There, 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 there. there you are, people. Probably. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we bring you we bring you some good stuff, don't we? So of course Vulcan uh, didn't exist, so it was perceived fictional. To, so this this astronomer thought he saw it, but he didn't. So it was obviously proven later that it didn't in fact exist. So, eighteen hundred and ninety five, the Italians invaded Abyssinia. Do you know okay. what country Abyssinia now is? You say the Italians invaded hmm. it, Abyssinia. Oh, um, I don't know, maybe like Egypt or Greece? Ethiopia. Ethiopia, ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, Abyssinia was obviously for the synonymous of Haile Selassie, who effectively all the Rastas mm. uh, follow, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, so even now, if you look at, um, you've probably heard of one of the greatest runners of all time, Gabriel Selassie. I've heard of him, yeah. Yeah, he's a ge- absolute genius runner. So, yeah, the Italians, and of course, this says the Italians were still in Abyssinia in World War II. Mm. Uh, so this, this carried on for many, many years. Uh, 1923, Britain gives Transjordan autonomy. So, of course, going back to this period of history, uh, Britain very, very dominant in uh, the Middle East. 
the dominant power. We talked last week about uh, Egypt only becoming an independent country in 1923, I think it was. So Transjordan is actually what uh, Jordan used to be called. Mm. Um, and Transjordan obviously dominated by Britain. And in fact, the Queen of um, Jordan up until very recently, I think she left and she, she fled. Uh, she was um, Queen oh, Noor, yeah. was actually a British subject. Mm. Um, so... Uh, final, final, uh, final fact on this part today is uh, 1938. Uh, this is very interesting. This, what well, is for me, um, 97th Grand National, uh, and a 17-year-old jockey called Bruce Hobbs uh, rode the winner called uh, Battleship at 40 to one. Uh, and it's and it's interesting for a number of reasons. Probably not to you listeners, but it's to me. Uh, <laughs> something I've known probably nearly about all my life because I've been interested in horse racing. Um, and Battleship was a very small horse. I think he might have been the smallest horse ever to win the Grand National. Uh, and it was just one of these things that was in one of the comics, comics that I read at the time. So, it was, uh, and, and interestingly, just to pass on some advice, uh, Bruce Hobbs went on to become uh, a top flat racehorse trainer um, and uh, the trainer of a horse called Viel, um, which, nearly pr- which actually is a single reason why I don't gamble anymore. Uh, other than when I go to the track. Mm. So one particular day, this is when I was working in William Hills in Canton in Cardiff, uh, the, it was the Lancashire Oaks, uh, and um, this was a horse I really love called VL, trained by Bruce Hobbs, uh, and I put £50 on this horse to win because I was certain it was going to win. Uh, and it was 10 to... I can even remember the odds. It was 11 to 10 on, and it lost by a short head to a horse called Sun Princess, trained by Dick Hearn and ridden by Willie Carson. Not that I've remembered. Yeah, Never yeah. left me, this says. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it would be like um, me, oh, I don't know, it would be like losing more than £10,000 today. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, uh, and, and, and it was just such a wake-up call. Fortunately, I used to do um, 12, I think it was, 12 football homes. Mm. Uh, so on the very same day, I had I picked out 12 fo- football teams to win at home. Uh, listened to the results at 9.30, and they all won. Yeah. <laughs> so I lost 50 quid and won 49 quid on the same day. Wow. And, 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 That's and, so and, jammy. And I, I had the, the common sense to realise that I had a problem, if you like. Mm. Yeah, you know, I shouldn't have been doing that, so I've, I've never done it to this day. So there yeah, we are. Yeah, that's little, little lesson for you. So um, moving on, wonderful, wonderful song from U2, New Year's Bringing day. you the news of old on This Week in History. With Paul Waite. I am Paul Waite, and welcome back to the final session of On This Week in History Today. Mm. Having given you a very deep gambling tip, so uh, my advice to people now is only gamble what you can afford to lose. So that's what I do now. Mm. Um, so if I go to the races, I'll take £300 cash, uh, and if I was to lose that, which I never have, as it turns <laughs> out, you hear it. Uh, mm. then um, you know it's not the end of the world to me. Mm. But a I lot of do. people don't know when to stop, do they? No, it's, it's quite sad. You, you hear of people you know. going to like Las Vegas and they've never gambled before in their life, and then they get drunk and they just like get and yeah, go blow all their life savings, isn't that? Anyway, 1914, the first successful non-blood transfusion in Brussels, non-direct blood transfusions. That means. Uh, b- blood from another person other than giving it to yourself. Right. Um, so uh, that was obviously quite a definitive moment in world history. Mm. Uh, 1933, uh, polythene was discovered by Gibson and Fawcett. Oh, it's so annoying, that is. It's, why is that? It's just an annoying thing, isn't it, polythene? Do you think? Yeah. yeah. It would be interesting to see what the world would be like without polythene. <laughs> <laughs> what would the world be like without polythene? Yeah, well, it's not really the most yeah. interesting thing. Yeah, it'd be a lot cleaner, yeah. Uh, 1958, uh, Bridge on the River Kwai wins uh, Oscar for the best film. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah. um, so uh, immortally, uh, so the, 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 um, the leader of the, the, the commandant of the camp in, uh, uh, in the film was played by Alec Guinness, of course, who went on to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. Mm, um, gave, I think he won the best Oscar. Absolutely amazing performance um i think the thing that uh, is amazing when you i've watched the bridge because uh, being ocd i've probably watched it about 20 times um and of course he 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 ends up the, the whole point of the character is he's a very decent honorable man and he he actually sort of loses the plot and he gets confused between uh sort of his his duty in terms of building the railway for the japanese and the fact that he's supposed to be a british Mm. officer opposing them you know and so he he actually becomes in the in the film a sort of an almost unhelpful character gets a backdrop of william holden for instance who's the american who is full-blown um 
you know, trying to trying to disrupt the Japanese. So if you haven't watched the film, watch it because it's freaking brilliant. I tell you. Um, 1967. Uh, just just put this in because it was relevant to. Uh, played this song many many times. Uh, 1967. The Turtles Happy Together reached number one. Ah, you like the Turtles? I do. We're happy, happy together. together. So where is the weather? Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 yeah, just uh, just ba, 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 I want you all to sing this to me today, uh, ba, 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 listeners. I make J P P Y. I make J P P Y. I know I am. I'm sure I am. H A P P Y. Yeah, because <laughs> if we were all H A P P Y, wouldn't the world be a better place? 1971, Bangladesh declared independence from Pakistan. Um, I think at that point it was uh, referred to as East Pakistan. Um, very interesting. This, uh, I think, Callum knows a bit about this about uh, this uh, region more than I do. Um, I don't quite understand why two Muslim uh, regions, mm. if you like, you know, East Pakistan and Pakistan, hate each other as much. I mean, from what I know, Bangladesh people would prefer India over Pakistan. Yeah. That's, that's how. Yeah. That's how. I, that's why I think it's true. I know that um, Pakistanis really, aren't, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking generally, but I'd like to test. Indians and Bangladeshis a lot. Yeah, yeah it's very really odd. Isn't it? So we'll find out why. Um, and the last one today, um, I didn't know this, uh, and I, I, I have for some time. If I had to say I supported anyone, uh, I support the New England Patriots. I used to su- I used to support uh, the F- San Francisco 49ers mm. uh, probably until I was about forty. Uh, I used to be a quarterback called Joe Montana. Uh, it's a wonderful name. Just love the kit, everything about them. They were a really good team. Uh, but for quite some time now, certainly um, I've got the name of him now, Tom Brady, uh, most successful quarterback in American history, seven uh, seven uh, Super Bowls, um, left the Patriots, What uh, I think he was the oldest quarterback to play in the Super Bowl final as it was, and he's gone on, I can't remember what team he moved to, and of course in his first season uh, he took them into the Super Bowl and they won as massive underdogs in the final. So Tom Brady... Um, the Wayne Gretzky of f- American football, in my opinion. So the Boston Patriots became the New England Patriots in 1971. So I say, didn't know that. So there we are. Hope you enjoyed uh, the history today. Aspen Weight Radio podcasts. Download at aspenweightradio.com or subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Podcasts.